Three minutes to nine. What turns a good sportsman or woman into an elite athlete? Is it natural ability? Is it training? Uh, or is it mind over matter? Well, neuroscientist and sports consultant Dr. Kerry Spackman here is the author of The Winner's Bible, in which he shares some of the techniques he's used with uh, sporting talents like the New Zealand All Blacks. And Kerry joins us this morning. We've been talking about New Year's resolutions and, and sticking to them. I think you're probably the first person we've ever had come in who's brought their brain with them. <laughs> um, tell Is us, that how can we, we use that to brain to, 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 to take control of our lives? Right, this is actually an enlarged version of a brain. It's about 50% bigger than normal. So um, the main thing that most people uh, get wrong is that they think the brain's just one simple computer. So all you need to do is change an idea or a program or a rule and everything's going to be wonderful. Life doesn't work like that because if you turn the brain over, you'll see inside it, it's got lots of different modules. And these modules all have their own agenda. And some of them point in one direction and some point in the other direction. And so you may know with your logical parts of the brain that you shouldn't eat chocolate, for example, but another part of your brain may desperately want you to eat chocolate and push you in a different direction. And it's a bit like paddling a kayak. If you paddle in one direction but your rudder is pointing in the other direction, you'll go round and round in circles. No matter how hard you paddle, you won't get the result. Mm. So one of the key things is to align your emotional circuits, your primitive circuits, with your logical circuits. Okay, so when we set New Year's resolutions for ourselves, like I must do more exercise, I must eat less fat or chocolate or whatever it is, you're saying that that's perfectly logical and part of our brain agrees with that. Mm. How do we train the other bit of our brain to also agree? Well, most New Year's resolutions fail. Mm. Probably only 5% last a year. That's the typical rule, maybe 10%. Um, so you need to recruit these logical, uh, these emotional circuits. And the way you do that is by aligning them with, with the goal that you have. So you need to tap into those uh, emotional circuits. You need to fire them up. It's a bit like if I want to lift a cup off the table. If I use my bicep, I can lift a cup up because that's the, a lightweight. But if I want to do some really heavy lifting, I need to bring my legs into play. And so the analogy is I need to bring my emotional circuits into play. There's no simple technique, so my book is full of lots of different tools. So it's not about a rule, it's about having a variety of tools that can use, uh, you can use to get those emotional circuits fired up and pushing in the right direction to do mm. the heavy lifting for you. Mm. Uh, your book is called The Winner's Bible, and, and you're talking about people writing their own book, almost like their own New Year's resolutions, aren't you, and yes. trying to, to have something physical in front of them that they can stick to. Yes. So I get each person to make their own personal winner's Bible. As you say, it's a little folder, but it doesn't just have goals because everyone can have a goal to have a super yacht, for example. To get that super yacht, you need to do a lot of things. Um, and so in the book, I take the uh, reader through a series of exercises to find out what their intrinsic drivers are, for example, their weaknesses, their strengths, and we uncover things about the person that they never knew before. Mm. So. Um, I've been very lucky. The book's gone to number one in New Zealand, and uh, it's outside every book for the entire year. And I think what has been successful is that when people read it, it gets them to do things. Rather than just having a vague dream, they actually have to do a lot of exercises, and they have to find out about themselves. They have to put in place some tools. So for me, it's about tools and not rules. One of the things that you ask people to do is get sort of a, a handful of friends to complete a survey about them and to be very honest. Now, that's a scary thing to ask people to do. It's quite scary for people to have to do it, isn't it? Yes, we've had a lot of feedback about this. So I bet you have. Yeah, we have. <laughs> and so the thing is, if you ask me to tell you what's wrong with you, I couldn't tell you face to face because if you're my friend, I don't want to upset you. So what we do is we provide a facility where you can invite four or more of your friends anonymously to log onto our website and leave confidential things about you. Then we mix and you them absolutely up. make sure that you, the person that they're talking about would never know who was making those comments? Yes. So you have to have a minimum of four people and then our software puts these comments together. And we don't look for just the usual things like extrovert or introvert. That doesn't help anybody. So we had a really interesting case, for example, of a woman who always talked on top of somebody else. So as you were talking to me, she'd work out the next part of the sentence and would sort of anticipate it and talk on top of somebody else. Now, she never knew she did this. Mm. It was only when she did the anonymous order that someone pointed it out to her. And the thing was, it had a huge impact on her life because people thought she was arrogant or hard or pushy or bossy, mm. and yet she wasn't. She just didn't know she had this habit. And so you un if you find out a lot of these things about you, it opens up a lot of things. 
I wonder if I can just ask, I mean, the self-help book industry mm -hmm. is a very lucrative one. How do you try and persuade people that actually this can help and it's not just another book that will get left on the bookshelf? Yes, I think, well, first of all, I didn't set out to write this book. I never thought I'm going to write a bestseller. I want to write a book on self-help. It was only because I'd worked with a number of people and they said this has worked. Mm. So I worked with a woman who was addicted to methamphetamine for eight years. Mm. She was a daily user for eight years. Um, two sessions with her and she's never used methamphetamine again. So it's very different from the typical self-help book, which is all about uh, rah, 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 motivate, you know, we can do better. I just don't think that works. And I think there's a real need in the market for solid tools. Okay. Well, good to talk to you this morning, Dr. Kerry Spackman. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Ladies, both of us were desperately trying not to talk not over you. Not at all, I know. And then I just did. Over you. <laughs> uh, it's uh, three minutes past nine.